This is The Cliff Yates Show. Personal growth, motivation, inspiration, and philosophies for a great life. Hey, everybody. This is The Cliff Yates Show. You are in the right place. Everything personal growth, motivation, inspiration, personal excellence, and we want to share with as many people as we can positive, impacting messages. So if you could, share this with whoever needs to hear it or you think needs to hear it. And I thank you for your faithfulness in the show. It's growing, and I appreciate you listening and or watching. And if you are listening and or watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel. Leave me a comment or two. And if you're listening on a podcast platform, subscribe to the channel. It helps with the algorithms of the computer age. It tells whatever platform you're subscribing on or commenting on that people are interacting with the show and they show it to more people. And so you can join me in having a positive impact on other people. So today we're talking about, or I'm talking about, faith, God, and Jesus. Faith, God, and Jesus, and my Christian walk. I am a Christian, and I will tell you the story of how that came to be. I've never put an episode about this before, but this is it. First time, you and me. Uh, I did not grow up in the church. Uh, I did not go to church as a kid. We did not go to church at all, except a couple times I do remember going to midnight mass during the Christmas season. That was my whole exposure to church. And I was an only child, so I grew up. My dad was a cop. And, you know, so we had a moralistic We, I say, I had a moralistic upbringing. Our whole family was, you know, right and wrong, do the right thing, no stealing, no cheating. And that's how it was brought up, very moralistic, do the right thing for the right reason in the right way, all those things. And the only thing I remember my dad referencing to church was, you know, he was the chief of police in the small town that I grew up in. And so he was, he would make statements to the effect, I can't sit in church with these people. I've you know, they they beat their wives all week. I go to these domestic cases, and they're slapping their wives around, and then they go to church, and they uh, repent, ask for forgiveness, and the next Monday, they're back at it again. I can't sit with hypocrites in a church. And I remember him saying that on several occasions. And uh, so I had no exposure to the church. And uh, I guess now that my walk Christ and and God and church has progressed to such an extent, I see that that may be a good thing. I I didn't have any bad habits or go off on the wrong path of faith. I I don't have anything to be unlearned. And so I I came to the faith and the Bible with fresh eyes and fresh ears. So that's a good thing. And the current wonderful church that I go to and wonderful pastors uh, at at the Coastline Community Church in Florida where we now live, and uh, Jason and Raina Bears, and Raina, Pastor Raina, the, the pastor's wife, who's also a pastor, she did not grow up in the church either. So I was refreshed when I hear these stories, and I, I, I dropped the judgment on myself, saying, well, I, I should have learned this when I was a kid. I have to go forward where, where I am right now. So I was not brought up in the church, but for some reason, I always felt and knew that there was a God. I always believed in God. I always felt there was a God. I, at, at times I would talk to God and I would have a feeling that God or a presence was with me, taking care of me, that I later came to know that it was God. And so I always knew that. And at times I would always, I would call it uh, something else, the universe or the subconscious but I knew that that was with me or taking care of me because I had made it through some precarious situations that were dangerous and came out okay. But And, I, and during those times, I had a feeling and, and knew that, that there was something there that I later came to learn, and I know that it was God. And then I later read not too long ago that, that each of us, because you have to wonder, what about the people who are not exposed to the Bible or God, they don't know how are they going to be judged if they didn't have any exposure. And I read something recently that every one of us is implanted with a void there, or they feel that we know 
we, we are all born with the knowledge that there is a God and that we just need to seek him out. And that will lead us and advance our faith and belief. So I was not brought up in the church. I uh, graduated high school. I always had the feeling never was an atheist or did not believe or never said there was no God. Even if I saw something horrific in my police career early on, I never felt like, oh, well, if there was a God, this wouldn't happen. So I never had that feeling. But I was not going to church, not exposed to the Bible. So I graduated high school, two years at Monterey Community College in Rochester, New York. Joined the Livingston County Sheriff's Department in upstate New York. And through movies, television, and I had a yearning to go to the big city. I had a yearning to go to a large metropolitan police force. And I still had the yearning to be in the entertainment industry. And so I end up applying after four or five years with Livingston County. I was applying. I saw an ad in a police magazine. The L.A. Sheriff ad I saw was ride the strip. We pay the gas. So I applied to the L.A. Sheriff's Department. I applied to LAPD. At the time, Houston, Texas was in a big boom, 1982-ish. And I applied to Houston, Dallas, Fort Lauderdale, New York City. Went to New York City, took the police test, and before I even got my results, I was already hired at the L.A. Sheriff's Department. And so that police path, I'll go into more detail on, a, on another episode, but I end up in California, dreams coming true, joining the L.A. Sheriff's Department, the largest sheriff's department in the world, graduate from the academy. Uh, and everybody in the L.A. Sheriff's Department must go to jail first as a uh, deputy sheriff, not as an inmate. So you must fulfill your jail assignment. Then you can go to patrol, which I wanted to be in patrol. I had worked five years in upstate New York in patrol, but of course, L.A. Sheriff's Department, a little different. So I uh, go to the Men's Central Jail. So the, really the toughest place you could go in the jail system but within a couple of months, I was transferred with another group of deputies to a minimum security jail, the Wayside Honor Rancho in Northern California. No, not Northern California, Northern Los Angeles County. So I'm in the jail and, uh, you know, you learn about jail and it's all new. So you're learning all new stuff for about a year. After about a year, I was getting a little bit restless about being in custody. I had a lot of anger in me and you know, I was ready to quit. I was ready. Uh, I had gotten notice of my score for the New York City Police Department. I had a notice that I could go back there and have my name put back on the active list and probably be hired pretty shortly. I was going to apply at LAPD. I just wanted to be out on patrol. That's what I joined the force for. So the custody environment was getting to me and uh, full of a little bit of rage and anger. And I, I had, but I was working with a bunch of fantastic deputy sheriffs and one of them was Bob Weinrich who was a devout Christian I didn't know it at first but I, I I just knew I liked him great sense of humor I know he liked me we we formed a bond and a friendship he was a very take care of business kind of deputy sheriff he didn't put up with any gruff never abusive but taking no crap from anybody I liked it I was of the same mindset and then he began to minister to me, I guess you could say, right? He, he, he not, not in a pushy way, he asked me if he could talk about the Bible with me, and he started ministering to me and speaking to me about the Bible and Jesus and God. And, and we would talk about it for hours and hours. So he was my first uh, mentor into faith, and he began telling me what it meant to uh, accept Jesus Christ into my heart and to declare with my mouth that I believe that Jesus was God in human form, that he came, that God came to earth as uh, in human form. He died for our sins. He was resurrected, sent it back to the right hand of God. And so if I declared with my mouth that I believe Jesus Christ was our Lord and Savior and that God resurrected Jesus after he died for our sins, that we were saved. We are saved. So I did that in 1985, uh, 
Bob Weinrich, he gave me my first Bible. He signed it. I, I still have that Bible today, 1985, given to me by Bob Weinrich. I put my own little thing in there. And so I, I had ticked the box as far as being saved and as a Christian. And so I remember my spiritual birth, born again that day. But that's as far as I went. I did not take next steps except for reading the Bible on occasion while I was still in custody, talking with Bob about it, and some other Christians, I would, we would have discussions, and I would read Bibles. I would read Bible passages that we discussed. And so I did that for the next couple years until in 1987 I went to patrol, and I still did not go to church. So I was not reading my Bible, but uh, I was, you know, busy with being in patrol in South Central Los Angeles at the time, 1987, which was during the cocaine wars of South Central Los Angeles. A lot of gang wars, gang shootings, death, crazy stuff going on. No excuse. I'm just saying during that time, I would have count, I counted myself as a Christian. I was not walking uh, the godly path. I was not in the word at all in any way. Uh, moralistically, I was doing what I should be doing, except as a Christian, uh, you know, looking back on that. And, you know, today, having come so much farther in my Christian walk, sometimes, you know, you can look back and with regret or remorse or repentance, of course, that I should have been doing this, I should have been doing that, but I've learned to not be so judgmental with myself in that regard. Because we are where we are, we're where we're supposed to be in our walk and we should not judge ourselves that we could have, should have done things differently because, and we think that way because we're in time. We are in time judging our past, where we are now, but God is not in time. God is not in the past, not in the future. God is and always is, doesn't know time. And so we can't be so hard on ourselves on a timeline. To us, it seems like so long ago I should have done these things. But our lifetime in reality, in the annals of time, as time is, our life is blink of an eye. Really, that's how short it is. So I've learned not to be judgmental on what I should have, could have done. But where I am in today, what I can be doing right now. And so I end up being transferred out of the South Central area after a few years. And now I'm in a... Uh, more rural area station, and that's where I meet my wife, and we go on to be married. But before we're married, my wife says, hey, let's go. And my sister, she has a pastor she sees. That it was actually a home church, and I liked it. I liked the pastor. It was Bible-based, and I was in Bible-based. I was into Bible-based. I think because I wasn't brought up Catholic. I wasn't brought up Presbyterian. I wasn't any denomination, so I was liking the message that was strictly from the Bible, and that's how Bob had mentored me, that this was the true word of God, and this is what we needed to be studying, following, was the word of God in the Bible. Words inspired by God and uh, written, inspired by the word of God. So I liked it, and uh, we went there for a few, probably maybe a year, Maybe not that long. And then we went to a Bible-based church for a time. And then we moved around a little bit, got away from the church a little bit, my, both my wife and I. But then we ended up being, through the family, going to Faith Community Church in West Covina, Bible-based, Pastor Reeves, and I loved it. Absolutely, from the time I walked in the door, felt at home, it was a mega church, uh, I guess you could say. I mean, it probably, I mean, each service, they had a couple of day on Sunday would have been, I would say, 500 to 1,000 people, you know. And it was like Terry Crews from Brooklyn Nine-Nine, a uh, pretty famous actor. Terry Crews was, he would come to church pretty frequently there. Jim Caviezel from uh, Passion of the Christ would come, come, uh, come in and speak on occasion. Terry Crews spoke there. I, so I loved, you know, being in the entertainment industry also, doing stand-up comedy and or acting, plus my police 
career. I was loving this church, Bible-based, and it got me into the Word really well. And my wife and I were both on the same page with uh, our friends and relatives who went to that church. So we went on a regular basis to that church. Was not involved in any other way in the church. So, but faithful to the church. Uh, we took care of tithing to the church. Uh, my wife takes care of the tithing. She writes the check, but we definitely tithe constantly to that church. Now, we lived uh, about 20 plus miles away from that church. So we ended up going to a church. We switched because it was getting the, the commute was could be arduous with L.A. traffic even though we were east of LA by about 25 miles. And so we, we, found a, we found a church that was like three and a half miles from our house in Laverne, California. Bible-based church, very small. So we go to the church and there's about um, 20, 25 to a service. Very intimate, little intimidating, right? Because now you're not so anonymous as you are when you walk into a mega church. So a little bit intimidating because people, but, the, but you know, everybody was welcoming, open, and uh, Alba loved it there, and I liked it there. Uh, I felt at home there. As a matter of fact, it was, uh, I had a message. Somehow we exchanged numbers with the pastor during one of the, before or after one of the services. And then I had a message from the pastor. He wanted to meet me at a coffee shop nearby uh, where we lived. And I'm thinking, oh, what did I do? I'm, honey, I'm in trouble. The pastor sent me a message. And so we went to this coffee shop. It was actually a coffee shop that I had gone to before that it was actually uh, Christian owned. And so there was a lot of Christian, you know, signs. And, and uh, it was a great little coffee shop. I liked it. So I met the pastor there. And we sat down, and he was from UCLA, or he had gone to UCLA, and we, I talked about his history, and he talked about mine. He wanted to know more about me. And so, I mean, the whole bottom line was that he, no, he just wanted to know everybody that came to his church. He wanted to, as long as he could, as long as his church was small enough, although he wanted to grow, of course, but as long as he was able to physically, able to meet everybody in his church on a personal level, he wanted to do that. Man, I thought that was really great. I really liked uh, him and his wife, and I really loved the church. And so we were really enjoying that church. We were getting more involved in this church. Alba would help with the kids, and uh, I was going to more and more services and other get-togethers that were not just a Sunday. Uh, there was other events of the church, and I would go to those. So I was getting more involved, getting more involved in the message of the week, researching what we talked about that week, what was getting into those Bible passages and learning the background, reading those, reading the Bible based on what we had just learned. And then, you know, really chewing, you know, uh, meditating on those words and reading those passages over again and seeing how that was speaking. And, and Alba and I both would, would do that. Very powerful. So that was like 2018, 2019 so we're just over about a year and a half into this church right near our house right near i mean you could go hiking from this church into the canyons uh behind the church and so it was a spiritual setting and it was so easy to go to i mean three and a half miles from the house we could have biked there as a matter of fact alba had was biking she sometimes would bike right past the church and and so very convenient and if you've ever lived and or worked around Los Angeles, the uh, depending on how many years you are there, struggling with the traffic can be very debilitating. So whenever you can interact close to where you live, then California is very wonderful. The weather is beautiful. And if you're not stuck in a five-lane traffic jam every day, uh, it's not soul-sucking. So we were really feeding our souls at this church and everything was going great. We were loving it. Everything was fine. Then in March of 2020, we are uh, visiting Florida just on vacation because we have been going to Florida for several years because uh, we would meet 
friends of mine and became friends of my wives. And then my mom and dad would meet us in Flagler Beach, Florida. And we would do that for four or five days. And we loved it. We loved every minute of it. And uh, Alba told me at one time, well, listen, we can never really move to Florida because of the grandkids. And so I, I had that in my head and I, I was resolved that that was okay because initially I really wanted to move to Florida because it would, you know, our summer places here and uh, where I'm at now on our summer island in upstate New York. So the commute would have been so easy being on the East Coast, no time change, shorter distance. So going from, and, and, and I thought it would work out perfectly as the, as the brutal heat heated up in Florida in May, we would be coming here to the nice cool breezes of upstate New York as they then came into summertime in June. So I thought that would work out great. But I understood now that we have more grandkids, we weren't going to be moving to Florida, but we were, we were vacation. We loved it. We loved, Alba and I both loved the beach. We have so many things in common. This was one of them that we loved the water and we loved being around and are at the beach. And we knew we couldn't live on the beach in California because I mean, you can find a knockdown shack for under $2 million in California. I mean, that's just the way it is. And so this was beyond our means. So we, we, uh, we were about 30 miles from the beach, which is not bad. But, you know, in our house was uh, valued when we sold it over 700000 And here we are 30 miles from the beach. So we were vacationing March of 2020. And I knew when I was researching, I said, I got to find a place right on the beach. We didn't want to go to Flagler Beach. We wanted to go more further south so that we were more in a tropical climate. You know, there are about three climates in Florida. In northern Florida, where Flagler Beach, I mean, it actually gets cold there. And the water is not blue. It's, it's more, you're above where the Gulf Stream comes around. So... I was looking for a place further south and I knew I, we have to be on the beach. My wife wants to be on the beach. So I was looking at vacation rentals by owner and I found this little place right on the beach in Melbourne. Actually, it was in the Atlantic, which is right on the border. And when I say on the border, I mean 100 yards from Melbourne Beach on a barrier island. And so we went out there and we loved it. Actually, we first went there in March of night in uh, 2019. So now 2020, we are 2020. We're going back there. So now we're back there, and of course now, all of a sudden, it's pandemic stuff is coming up. So right into things are starting to shut down, and uh, now our flights canceled. We got to make other arrangements. They're closing things down in California. Don't go out of the house. Restaurants are closed. Mask only. And now Alba, who was born in Cuba, tells me, hey, this is, I mean, this, this is communism. This is what they do in a communist country. They start restricting your movement. Uh, they take your rights away. So now we're stuck in, uh, stuck. Well, we're in Florida. We can't get back. Our flight is canceled. So my wife, Alba, goes, I don't want to go back there. I do not want to go back to California. I'm not going to live that way. You know, my dad brought us to America to live free in no way. I'm not, I'm not doing it. So, okay. And then she goes, let's look at a place here. Look at a place. Now I was like hesitant. And she was like, you're the one that wanted to move here. In this, why wouldn't you even look at a place? I mean, I thought you wanted to move here. I go, yeah, but I had resolved in my head that we weren't. And now, but okay, let's look at a place, you know? So she was looking, uh, local realtor thing. She, she picked up and, so she goes, here's a place that uh, looks really nice. It's a condo. And I thought, I never want to live in a condo. But uh, although we're on a condo on the beach, when I rented the place, it was beautiful. Right on the sand. So because um, we were in Flagler Beach, we had to walk across the street, A1A, to get to the beach. But this place we rented was right on the beach. And we loved it. The water's beautiful blue. And... Uh, so we find a place to look at. And so we go down the street. It was about five miles north of where we were renting in Indian Harbor Beach, Florida, where we live now. And uh, so 12 miles south of Cocoa Beach, still on the same barrier island, which is about 45 miles long. It's a big barrier island, very narrow, but I digress. Uh, so we looked at the place and uh, Alba goes, what do you think? And I go, I like it. 
She goes, no, I love it. Let's put an offer in. I go, what? Long story short, we are visiting Florida in March. Our whole, our house in California is sold and we are in a U-Haul truck driving to our new place on, we arrive at June 5th. Visiting in March and by June 5th, we are out of California, sold everything. Well, everything was in two U-Haul trucks. We're living in Indian Harbor Beach, Florida. I mean, it was a major move. But we're loving it. We are on, and we're living on the beach. This place is on the beach. I never thought I wanted to live in a condo. This condo is 2,050 square feet. So it's 2,050 square feet, three bedrooms, two and a half baths with a bonus room that is our office. Now, our house in California was 1,700 square feet. A house. And now we're in a condo. It's 300 square feet bigger. So I love this condo. It's right on the sand right on the beach, and so I like it. Happy there. We're walking the beach. We're meeting a lot of nice people like mine. You know, and that, now you got to understand, at this time, it is open. We are in free Florida. I mean, it is open. There are people in the businesses that are wearing masks, but we are, we are not wearing masks. So we are living in free Florida, and we are loving it. California, I mean, it is shut down. So my wife's happy. I'm happy. So my wife found a place down the beach where she'd like to stop in and have a nice coffee. And she, she takes me there. It's a band, It's a fantastic little place. And the lady who runs it is Mel. Her name is Melanie. Well, the name of the business is Mel's Tiki Cafe. So we had gone there a couple of times and, and my wife tells me, listen, Mel from Tiki's Cafe told me about a church. Let's go check it out. And see if you like it. Because she knows I'm, I'm particular. So I go, okay. I'm telling you, Coastline Community Church, as soon as we walk in the door. I'm t- no, I feel at home. I feel at home already. Five minutes into this. I love the pastor. Pastor's wife. And the pastor's not there. There are other pastors there. Now in Faith Community Church in West Covina, when, the, when Pastor Reeves was not there, and his son would be the pastor. I, we didn't connect, so I really didn't. I didn't connect to his services. If he was pastor, I really didn't want to see or hear the service. But I would because it was the message. In Coastline Community Church, I love the message. I love the pastor. If it's the pastor, the pastor's wife, or Anthony, the uh, another pastor who takes over for the pastor when he's. I love them all. I love Pastor Jason Bears and his wife, Raina. I mean, uh, they're just great people from Tennessee. And they ended up coming to Indian Harbor Beach, Beach on faith, uh, similar to us, but they had come 15 years earlier. And so immediately we have a home in this church. I'm loving it. This is during the pandemic. Not one, not one mask is in the place. And it's a total freedom message from the Bible that this pastor I'm loving it. I'm just loving it. And so, found a home church there, learning so much about God, Jesus Christ, and so into the Word. And so, I mean, we've been going, so we were going to church on a regular basis every Sunday. Never missed a Sunday. And we were going there for several months when I'm uh, accosted by a man. No, not by, I was not accosted. I was approached by a young man, and believe me, everybody, and I've read this pastor just recently who said, and I now I know how Pastor Jason got this message, because he says the same thing, and now I know where I got it, because I started reading somebody that the pastor mentioned, and now in his book he says that his service starts in the parking lot, and so that's where you first reach people, and so at Coastline, that's what they do. You're welcomed from the minute you see the parking people You're welcomed. People are glad you're there. They meet you with a smile. You know that this is the culture of the church. And so that's Elba and I. This is our mindset. This is our culture of our home. So we're loving it. So we're there a few months, and a young man approaches me. A young man. He's probably 50 plus. And so he, hey, are you guys new here? 
And I says, no, we've been coming here for a few months. He goes, oh, okay, I've, I've, I've seen you before. And we never talked. And so I told him who we were and uh, a little bit of my background. And so he knew I had recently moved there from Los Angeles. I had been a retired L.A. County Sheriff Sergeant. And then he said, well, I, and then I, he knew I was from Rochester, New York area originally. And he goes, I'm from Brighton, just outside of Rochester. That's where I'm from. And then he mentioned a young man that he worked with in the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. This guy's a retired officer also. And so we're, we're connecting like you wouldn't believe. And, uh, and so the guy that he mentioned he knew, I'm trying to think of his name now, he wrote a book. And I had met him before. And that man that he taught interrogation with was a partner of one of my best friends from Rochester, New York, from the Monroe County Sheriff's Department, who I now Bible study with. Things connect. It's just amazing. Coincidence? No. Things start connecting. The dots start connecting. So we hope. So in our conversation, he goes, you need to be joining the safety team here at the church. And I said, yeah, of course. Uh, whatever I need to do. Let me do it. Listen, this is what you do. Contact this person and tell them you want to join the safety team. And then we'll get the ball rolling from there. And so that's what I did. And so the young man that I interviewed, I'm, we, we connected right away. And uh, knowing my background. And so then, so before I joined, before I, things connecting. So before I joined the safety team, Brad Lewis, the original person I'm talking to, I'm talking about, he tells me later, well, at, a, at the next service, he's telling me, oh, you know, your classmate from the L.A. Sheriff's Department, he's also a member of this church, and he's also on the safety team. So now I'm thinking, oh, Brad's confused because, I mean, how would, or why would my classmate from my 1983 L.A. Sheriff's Academy be here at this church on the safety team? And so I'm, thinking he maybe it's a classmate from my high school or maybe it's or maybe I'm thinking I thought Brad had me confused with somebody else I really did so so the next service that I come to he goes yeah you got to meet your your classmates here today Ray Roth Ray Roth Ray Roth was in my class at the LA Sheriff's Academy 1983 class 221 we had, after we graduated, we went separate ways. We saw each other a couple times at some comedy gigs that I did for the department. But other than that, I'm pretty sure we went the last, definitely probably the last 10 to 15 years, I never saw Ray Roth talk to him or heard from him. Now I'm at this church face-to-face -face with my classmate, Ray Roth. He's on the safety team now with me. He lives two miles from where I'm living right now, Indian Harbor Beach. And so now we've reunited again. And so similar stories with everybody that's on the safety team as far as, the, as far as their law enforcement background. So I have this now new church family and this new safety team within the church family. And so in the midst of this, uh, we get introduced, or no, we just meet, because that, I mean, the worship team, the the worship leader, the singer, Brad, and his wife, Danielle, so we meet them. Hi, how are you? I'm, you know, we're Cliff, and this is Alba, we just moved from California. Yeah, so did we. We moved, uh, we were from, uh, I think they were from Santa Clarita, which is also within the Sheriff's Department area, so they lived Brad and Danielle, who now the worship leaders, the song leaders at the church that I'm now at, had recently, within a year, I think it was a year before, they had moved there to that church, found a home there. They moved from California. And when they lived in California, they actually had lived within 30 miles of Alba and I. All these things are coming together. So we found a church, and this church is... So now I'm in a little bit deeper in my walk with Christ in the Word, God. And now I have found and connected with so many friends and uh, family. Well, they're my family. They're my brothers and sisters in, in Christ at this church. And that's where I am. 
with my walk with God. I actually have read uh, the Bible pretty much all the way through, and I also study vehemently, vehemently, I don't know, intently. I, I really meditate on the Bible, and I probably read the Bible five days a week. Sometimes I read it seven days a week, and uh, both Alba and I find time. Alba, Alba listens to the Bible on audiobooks, and I've read several books, A Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. I've, written many, I've uh, read many Christian books and just have learning and delving more and more into the Bible, uh, specifically the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, uh, so, and then one of my neighbors, connecting the dots, one of my neighbors in our condo complex, Tom Kenny, Barb and Tom, who we love, our beautiful neighbors. They are from Fairport, New York, upstate New York. And they are, they were brought up Catholic, but they are Christians. They're Christians and they are Catholic, but they're open. They just want to learn more about the Bible, God, and Jesus. And so we have connected on that level. So Barb and Tom, Alba and I, we both connect. And they're from, and they still have a place. And they come to the island here where I'm at now. When they're here, they come up for three or four days and we fellowship here on the island. And so, as a matter of fact, Barb and Tom have both come to the uh, to Coastline Community Church. And they love it. And they, they've come back several times. But they go to several different churches, and they get this. So, so now, connecting the dots. So my best buddy uh, from uh, the Monroe County Sheriff's Department in Rochester, New York, who's who, he was detective partners with, uh, I can't think of his name, but he wrote the book, and he ended up teaching interrogation in Florida with Brad Lewis from the church. So now... I have a Bible study group with Tom Kenny, my buddy Tom Vasile, who is now uh, doing a chaplaincy. He's a chaplain for the Monroe County Sheriff's Department and the Rochester PD. And so once a month, we have a Bible study together via a Zoom. And so that's where I am with God, faith, and Jesus Christ right now. And I had to tell that story because, and you know what? It's a lifelong journey. And, uh, I'm so filled uh, with rejoicing. And as the world is going the way it is, because, and you know this channel is positivity, motivation, inspiration, but you have to pay attention to what's going on in the world. And with what's going on in the world today, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you're into personal excellence, personal growth, and all that does is really make you more aware of your surroundings and what's going on, in the world. And so uh, more and more, you have to come to the realization that there is a spiritual war going on. And so more and more, I think our faith becomes very important. And so that's why I felt it was appropriate and I was obligated even today to share with you my, my walk with God and Jesus. And that's the background I've never shared with you before, but that's where I am. So I, I'll be interested in where it if you're a faithful person or whatever you believe in, by the way, I respect whatever your faith is in or not in. I respect you either way. And uh, I'm, I'll be interested in uh, hearing, seeing, and I will answer your comments. So please comment. And so, so it's just amazing that Tom Kinney, who I did the Bible study with, is going to be coming back again this year to the island, but also Ray Roth, the classmate, that now lives near me in Florida, also on the safety team. He's traveling to Ottawa, which is about a three-hour drive from here. He's stopping here at the island this year. And Brad Lewis, the guy who originally contacted me at the church in Florida, he is traveling back to Rochester this summer. He's coming up here to the island. These people from my church family. And, uh, man, they're going to have such a spiritual experience here just because... You know, when you're on an island and distractions and noise is taken away, God speaks to you and you hear him. And so that's going to be very interesting. 
Maybe they'll come on a podcast with me. We'll see if they're interested in doing that. I love you guys and gals, everybody. Thanks for checking in. I'll be interested in your comments on this episode. And um, keep the faith. I know I do. And the way the world is going today, I think it's a spiritual war. And I think that's a spiritual war that we need to get involved in. We need to take a stand. Uh, while even though that we are love and we love people, we need to take a stand today, uh, specifically in faith, because, you know, as soon as you, as soon as you walk with God and you make an act of faith and you follow Jesus and the Bible, the enemy is alerted and the attacks come, uh, but you're protected and you're going to be okay. So I love you. Godspeed. I'm not ashamed to say that. And in a few months, I'll be saying Merry Christmas also. So please, uh, if you're listening and are watching on YouTube, subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening on a podcast platform, subscribe to the podcast because then you get notified of the next episode. And it tells, it tells the podcast people, hey, somebody's interacting with the show. Show it to more people that need to hear a positive, impacting message. All right, everybody. 